Blazers, and welcome back to Doctor Who Literature, the podcast taking you through the world of the Target novelizations in publication order. My name is Jason, and I'm your host on this journey, this very long journey. We've got a very packed and interesting program for you this week. The book is Doctor Who and the Planet of Evil. This creates an interesting dilemma for me because... Although Evil comes from the stupendous Philip Pinchcliffe era, it is not one of my favorite stories. And Simon Hart and I are going to have a very lively conversation about the merits of Planet of Evil, the TV story, a little bit later on during the program. This is Sai's fourth appearance on the show. Very excited to have him back. In terms of other program news... Happy to announce that the podcast now has a dedicated email address to make it easier for you all to contact me. So please, start sending me letters, and I will read out the most interesting ones on the air. I know you guys, you've got some very interesting letters in you, so let's have them. That's Doctor Who Literature, drwholiterature at gmail. Once again, the email address is drwholiterature, drwholiterature at gmail.com. Hit me up, yo. Now, this week, we also watched here from the States as uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson's uh, career uh, basically imploded and he was forced to resign. The, the day that Sai and I recorded was the day before he ultimately resigned, but there was a very, very intense string of events going on at 10 Downing Street at the time that we were recording, so the recording that Sai and I put together does have some elements of uh, live tweeting what was going on at 10 Downing Street during that hour. You do not want to miss that. I will have a new episode of Trap One coming out along with Mark in another week or so. I will post a link to that, and I'll tell you about it in next week's episode. Not quite ready yet. One last programming note is you'll notice that the audio is a little bit glitchy when I was recording with Psy. That's probably my fault. I was using my backup headset, which is just not up to the task. So I did my best in the edit to minimize the ambient noise. It is not the usual high sterling audio quality that you've come to expect out of Jason. But it's a really fun conversation, so please give it a listen. Let's get to it. Welcome back to Doctor Who Literature. I am happy to announce that my guest today is my first four-time guest. Oh my goodness. Mr. Four-time guest, please introduce yourself. Hello, it's uh, Cy Hart here again for the fourth time. Wow. You are now my all-time record holder. This is my 34th episode and this is your fourth appearance. That's a pretty good record. That's not bad, is it? Well, thank you very much for inviting me again. So, we are recording this, for me it is the afternoon, for you it is the evening of Wednesday the 6th, and I am following on Twitter, and it seems as if your Prime Minister seems to have a new resignation every, uh, on average, 45 seconds. Yes, it's um, been quite a day for politics in the UK today, so um, it's all going on, but he he seems to be clinging on for, well... For God knows what. <laughs> he hasn't got any any staff. He hasn't got a cabinet. Um, I don't think he's got enough people to make up a cabinet. So we shall see. He's um, very much reminded me of um, Davros in the bunker in at the end of Genesis of the Daleks right now, that he's just going to go on whatever happens. <laughs> that is a very worrisome analogy because, as you know, Sai, Davros had an army of Daleks waiting in the next room to exterminate the opposition. I know, right? So, yeah, we're we're in big trouble over here, as per usual. I guess the question is, if we're going to be recording for about an hour, will Boris Johnson still be Prime Minister at the time that we end this call, about an hour from now? 
Well, I'd like to think he won't be, but we shall see. On past form, he will probably still be clinging on in there with Nadine Dorries looking after him. We are recording this in real time, so there may be breaking news events. If my phone starts blowing up, I'll be sure to break into the program so we can discuss. Okay. That might be better than the source material we're talking about tonight. <laughs> I was about to do a ham-handed segue into the source material about an inexperienced uh, starship captain who uh, has no business being in command and does a terrible job of it and has to be removed by part four. <laughs> well, that only leaves us one choice of story we could possibly be watching. Not what? Not even watching. Reading! <laughs> <laughs> I know which podcast I'm on. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is this is this is not the uh, round and round like a hamster in a cage show with a uh, Joe Ford and a cast of thousands. No, I'm, I've heard apparently it's the um, the Dominator Celebration podcast. Yeah, Fraser has clued into the fact that I'm on. I think a three week streak of talking about how much I dislike the Dominators. <laughs> And now I've brought it up again. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> the problem is the novelization is about a year away because I'm on book yes. 34 now and the Dominators is book like maybe 82. So that's a long way to go before I talk about the Dominators on the show. I have to keep interest high. I'm building up to the event of the Grand Dominators uh, showdown. <laughs> well, you're doing very well considering so you've got a lot of momentum to keep up though we are talking of course about doctor who episodes with starship captains who go nuts and lose their command so we're talking today about are we talking about the wheel in space are we talking about the uh, fury from the deep are we talking about ambassadors of death there's a lot there's a, there's a lot of uh narrows it down here yeah well there's a yeah there's a lot of um commanders just going mad and uh that's a real doctor who trope um, but it is one that hadn't been used for a couple of years, I think, at this point. I guess the closest analog would be Death to the Daleks, which didn't quite have a commander go mad, but it did have a very unreliable bad commander who made bad choice after bad choice. Yeah, I, there, there is a certain um, mirroring there, I think, possibly. So our book today is The Planet of Evil by Terence Dix. But of course, before we get to the book, we have our usual preliminary chit-chat. We've already talked about the state of your government. And if he resigns while we're talking, this will forever be known as the podcast that brought down Boris Johnson. <laughs> now that would be a good claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sai, what else have you been up to in podcast land since your last appearance here about three months ago? You were last year for episode 23. I was, yes. Um, so, well, since then, um, I have um, actually d recorded um, six episodes of A Hamster with a Blunt Penknife on the same story that we discussed last. So, um, uh, and Joe is just um, releasing um, our Genesis of the Daleks commentary with, with Fraser as well, um, which was was really good and really thoroughly enjoyed that. So, and I did an episode of Gallifrey's Most Wanted last night, which will be out shortly as well, talking about Matt Smith's years as Doctor Who. I just did a Gallifrey's Most Wanted with Ross last week, talking about the Tom Baker in the States PBS years. So I see he's going ah. to Well, there we go. <laughs> Ross will talk to everyone. It's really good, isn't it? So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially once he once he got to me, it's the bottom of the barrel of podcasting. Oh, that's that's not true, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> so, how about maximum power? I understand that your Blake Seven podcast is gearing up for another season. Yes, well, we've recorded all of Series B. Oh, um, we're just editing the episodes at the moment, so hopefully they will be coming out shortly. So we're trying um, sort of to arrange with. Um, sort of between us all just to make sure everyone is ready and everyone's done the bits that they need to do so hopefully it won't be too much longer so lots of people have been waiting a long time for that so um yeah it'd be good to get those out again and what else is in the hopper i know that i'm doing a trap one with mark coming up in a few days because he was just in new york last week yes podcasters meeting 
Wow, that was that was good to see. We took over Times Square. We managed to get the Trap One logo superimposed on a Times Square billboard <laughs> for a good forty-five seconds. Wow, which exhausted the Trap One budget for a good couple of years, but it was all in a good cause. Mm-hmm. It was well worth it. So we're going to be discussing the Doctor Who stories that take place in New York, which is a pretty motley bunch of uh, stories of wow. highly yes. varying from, quality. Yeah, from the chase to, to the Angels Take Manhattan. You've got some fun coming up there. The chase <laughs> is lots of fun. The Angels Take Manhattan, uh, not so much. No. But, uh, <laughs> we will break it down. We will talk about it. We will uh, have stories. We will have anecdotes. That should be a very fun New York themed trap one podcast mm-hmm. session. Yes, and I think you and me are doing opposite um, target books for trap one as well from the new range, aren't we? So yeah, I have picked two of the five, although one of the five was pushed back a year. Yes. So I know I'm doing Stones of Blood. I forget the other one, but I signed up for two of for two of them. Yes, and I think I signed up for the opposite two from you. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the only solution is to have you back on here again so we can talk about novelizations on my show rather than Mark's. Well, I, well go on then. <laughs> <laughs> talk you into it. Twist it your arm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, Planet of Evil, would you like to hear my confession? Go on then. Because you have your candle burning in the background back there. Uh-huh. It's very ecclesiastical. Right, go on. Tell me. Watching Doctor Who as a kid, 1984-85, starting with the Davison era, reaching caves of Androzani, circling back around from Robot onward. Not counting Sontaran Experiment, which is only a two-part story, Planet of Evil is the first story that I did not like as a Doctor Who fan. Oh. Well, there we go. And I've given it many chances over the years, and I appreciate what it's trying to do. I was raised in a Forbidden Planet house, so I certainly got right away that this is a kind of pastiche of Forbidden Planet. And I recognize the uh, special effect of the antimatter monster is very, very similar to Morbius's id beast. That's Forbidden Planet Morbius, not Brain of Morbius Mm -hmm. Morbius, which we talked about on this show last week in episode 33. But I just, even watching it now, I don't think it measures up to the other high heights of the Hinchcliffe era in terms of acting or writing. It's it's primarily an unpoetic script, and it's mostly functional dialogue. I can appreciate what it's trying to do, but I don't think the episodes really energize me the way that is done by a Seeds of Doom or a Pyramids of Mars or a Deadly Assassin or some of the less problematic elements of Talons of Wang Chiang or Ark in Space or many others. For me, this is middle of the road. And looking to the novelization, I think Terrence Dix is not crazy about the story either because this book is noticeably shorter and less detailed than the two books that he wrote immediately, the two or three books he wrote immediately before. So my thesis going in is that this is not one of the books or episodes that I enjoy the most, but I know that with you, I'm always going to get, if not a contrary opinion, at least a lively debate. So let me hear your Planet of Evil origin story. Right. Well, when I was young, um, this was a book that I really enjoyed. Um, I thought this was... A, a good story. It rattled along quickly. It was an easy read, so it it was was good. And then I saw it years later, and I hated it. <laughs> I really didn't like it on TV at all. Um, like you, I um, missed any kind of wit, any kind of non-functional dialogue. Um, I liked the character of Vashinsky very much. I think he's a a really good character and really well played. I think generally it is well played, but it left me cold. And it's got a great jungle. It's got a really great jungle. 
but that's not something that you can um, sort of rest a reputation on. And I think that sails through on its production rather than anything actually in the story because the story just it leaves me I'm bored mostly. Planet of Wretched Evil, I tend to call it, because it's one of my <laughs> least favourite Doctor Who stories. Wow. See, I think it's middle of the road. You think it's even worse than I think it is. So that's certainly a contrary opinion. That's true. I mean, it's, I probably oversell it because it's one of those things that sort of through my time on internet forums and everywhere else, it's one of those things I've become known for that I'm the person who doesn't like Planet of Evil very much. And then you sort of magnify that sort of through the years and it's just... But it's just a story I would happily not ever watch ever again. And there aren't many stories that I feel that way about. I've given it enough goes and it it never reveals anything. It's Louis Marx certainly was capable of poetic dialogue because his next yes. story after this one is Mask of Mandragora, which is very lushly written. Maybe he either he learned his lesson or he preferred the pseudo historical to the future uh, spaceship bound sci fi quote unquote epic. Well, I wonder that. I and mean, um, Louis Marx um, had um, a real interest and was an expert in um, the Renaissance and wrote. Um, hugely um, about that period. So that might just, that setting probably just excited him far more than than this story. I think this is one of those stories where Robert Holmes and Philip Hinchcliffe were in the office coming up with ideas and said, oh, well, we could rip off Forbidden Planet and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with a planet that's alive that changes from day to night. And um, oh yeah, and we'll give that to Louis. He can, he can write that one. Off you go. Here you go. It's certainly a great idea because if you look at Forbidden Planet, Forbidden Planet almost has Jekyll and Hyde in it because Morbius in person is an affable guy superficially, but then he has this secret unconscious id beast that is wreaking havoc across the planet, destroys all of his shipmates, and then tries to destroy Captain Leslie Nielsen's crew. So there's almost kind of sort of the same vibe with Sorensen, who has this dark side that he may or may not be aware of that is causing all of this devastation. So the idea is that part one and part two is Forbidden Planet, part three and part four is Jekyll and Hyde. It almost works. And you have Louis Marx, who certainly was good with dialogue and other stories. And then you have Antimatter, at times, it feels as if Louis Marx is taking bits of the Wikipedia page on antimatter <laughs> and plugging it into his script by way of data dump. Now, of course, Wikipedia didn't exist back in 1975-76. He did read articles on it, and he certainly had an interest in the topic. And what fascinates me is that looking at Wikipedia, the man who is considered, the mathematician who is considered the father of antimatter is Dirac, who, of course, in Doctor Who terms, is a... Uh, the person for whom Adric is named. Yes, there we go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How Exeter, we've come full circle. <laughs> There's always a connection somewhere, isn't there? There is certainly room for this to be a really, really good script. I don't watch stories for set design alone. The jungle is nice. Hooray. That's not yep. enough. What really gets me, Doctor Who's big special effect is the dialogue. <laughs> There's very little that's witty about the story. And if you watch the shots of Tom Baker, if you watch his reaction shots are in the background, he is bored to tears. Yeah, there are are shots where he's very flat in the background, just sort of staring wide-eyed, not even reacting to anything about him. Very unlike him. Yes. And the odd thing is, um, I know it was Liz Sladen's favourite story, but I think that was more because she was comfortable because it was all filmed at Ealing and at BBC TV Centre. So there was no uncomfortable location shoots in the cold and wet. But <laughs> I might be wrong. She might have really loved the script. She certain Sarah certainly gets some good material in this. And of course, there is the uh, Doctor quoting Romeo and Juliet. Uh, when they're in the uh, the jungle scene, that's you know Tom Baker adding value whenever he can. Yeah, and there's 
anytime Tom Baker wakes up from unconsciousness, he always says something funny. Yes. You have some more of that here, which I'll get into later in the program. But none of these supporting characters, with the possible exception of Vyshinsky, really have any interesting story arc. This is Michael Wisher's last appearance on the show, well, until Shakedown. He gets nothing to do. No, and considering what he's had last season in both um, Genesis of the Daleks and Revenge of the Cybermen, um, he really doesn't add a great deal to this this story, unfortunately. Um, again, it's it's quite a strong cast. So um, you've got, um, what's his name, who plays Morelli? Is it Morelli? Michael Wisher as Morelli. Oh, Michael Wisher as Morelli. Um, I am thinking of the other guy. <laughs> it's not Morelli. See, even the character names don't. don't. Is that? Um, am I thinking of Dahan? Dahan is Graham West, and he was also he had a pretty meaty part in the War Games. I am. Yes, he has the one line that I always remember from this story, which is the one tiny bit of wit that is in the script, where he's got the line where he says, "Carry him in, carry him out." Should be the space um, service motto, and the bit about. Um, Going flying one way and then flying back, and eventually you're going to meet yourself. Why don't you just stay halfway? Which is vaguely witty and clever, I think. They interviewed Graham Weston for the DVD, which is probably about 20 years old by now. And if I'm recalling this correctly, he said on the DVD making of documentary, David Maloney gave him one bit of direction. And that was the phrase, there's one on every ship. So he was meant to play the screwball class clown. Uh, I don't know what his rank would have been in the Marissian military, probably like a sergeant. But in part one and part two, he is strictly a background character with no flavor. Then he gets personality in part three, and then he's killed off a few minutes later. So it's almost a case of yes. too little too late. Mm-hmm. But again, it feels like it's um, a crew that are just designed to be expendable and killed off. And they're killed off one by one in the same horrible way. And I should point out that Michael Wisher gets a second role in part four, voice only, where he is also killed off in a horrible way. Yes. Well, probably deserves to be after that accent. (laughs) (laughs) And then you have the crime that is giving an actor of the caliber of Lewis Mahoney and giving him another brief functional flavorless role then 32 33 years later Stephen Moffat comes along and says I'm going to give Lewis Mahoney something better to do and I'm going to put him in a little script called Blink (laughs) which is one of the other stories I don't like so (laughs) poor old Lewis Mahoney at least he gets Uh, Frontier in Space which I do like (laughs) even if you don't like Blink you have to at least give me his he is very very good his scene is the emotional core of the story Yes, it's true. Yeah, and he is he, he's marvellous. He's really, really good there and really breaks your heart. Although what's funny is I got this off of the Stephen Moffat Murray Gold audio commentary on the Blink DVD. The actor who played young Billy Shippen was not told that Louis Mahoney was playing him three or four decades on and was not told that Louis Mahoney had an accent. Oh, yes, because he gains an accent, doesn't he? And then he had to go back and loop all of his dialogue to match Lewis Mahoney later on. <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> but again, Lewis Mahoney is capable of a lot more than standing around, barking orders and being nasty, and then dying in a, an ambiguous, never quite fully explained way. He deserved more than that. Yes. Script. Absolutely. And then we've got Prentice Hancock bellowing his way through the script. And I know the character is supposed to be unlikable and one note, but it's basically the same character he's playing. He played in um, Planet of the Daleks, isn't it? It's the same as uh, Weber. He's, yeah, he's impetuous. He's not suitable for command. He's headstrong. He's shouty. He's really unlikable. And he probably does a really great, 
job of bringing that character to life. But because you end up hating the character so much, you judge the performance on that as well. I will say that I spent the better part of the 1990s on Wreck Arts Doctor Who calling Prentice Hancock one of the most annoying guest actors in the show. Now, his bit part in Spirit from Space is fine. It's a bit part. I think he's very good in another bit part in Rebo's Operation, which is one of the all-time great screens. Yes, he's really likable there. But his two big turns here in Planet of the Daleks, he plays a heel. And the, um, the, the emotional arc that Salomar has to play is completely false. This is not what a person breaking down sounds like. It just doesn't ever ring true. For the same way that I don't think Kinda is one of my favorite stories, I know that Simon Rouse's performance is supposed to be the best portrayal of a man losing his humanity. It doesn't really strike me as emotionally accurate, but that's just a preface to say that a few years ago at Gallifrey one in Los Angeles, I paid for the guest receptions. It's kind of like speed dating. You're at a table. They have eight guests. You get like five minutes with each guest. So, you know, five minutes with Paul McGann. This is right after the presidential election with Trump. So he was kind of, you know, morose. Yeah. Five minutes with Katie Manning, who was a force of nature. Five minutes with uh, Daphne Ashbrook. Five minutes with, I don't even remember who. Prentice Hancock shows up at our table, sits down, had encyclopedic knowledge of every Doctor Who story he'd done 45 years earlier. Polite, friendly, sweet. I was just so impressed. And I felt bad that I'd been bashing him on mm-hmm. online forums for 30 years because the actual man is an amazing human being. Yeah, well, there we go. Well, that. As I've said on other podcasts, that's the power of acting, isn't it? And that's what you want. So he's not like his characters, and that's a good thing. But yes, it is very annoying. And again, the Sal- the Salomar's dialogue is not very... No, it's not inspiring, is it? Not in the slightest. I mean, if, if you start off... Well, go on, Vashinsky, give us an order! <laughs> You're the commander now! He has to start off likable, and then he has to lose his sanity, so you sympathize with him, like David Dacre in Creature from the Pit. Hi, yeah, sorry, this is Jason from the future. I should have said Nightmare of Eden. Please please don't at me. He's got to start off as a good guy before he turns bad. Otherwise, it's a one-note performance, and that's the problem in the conception. That's not certainly the the fault of the actor who doesn't write his own No, he's, he's playing the material he's given, and he's playing it to the best of his ability it's just not very good material that's the problem and the one person who does do more than the um the part on the page as written is Ewan Solon as um Vyshinsky who is dignified uh, in the face of Princess Hancock and is really likable and you can see he he adds small dimensions to 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 the character he's he's really really good and then you have frederick yeager who was in the middle of a run of really big supporting parts he comes back as professor marius not morbius but marius a couple yep. of years later and gives the world the gift of canine for which i am still very very thankful me too. Where do you rate his performance as Professor Sorensen? Because he is kind of sort of the big bad guy in the script, but he gets, you know, the unexpected redemption at the end, which is yeah. not as originally scripted. That was Philip Hinchcliffe's idea. Yes. I, I, yeah, I think he's, he's, he's very good in this, actually. He's, he makes Sorensen... Um, so, to begin with, you're you're very much on Sorensen's side, I think, because he is the lone survivor. He's been there a long time. He's desperate. He wants to get away. He's made a big discovery. And I think you're sort of on his side for a little bit and then start to realise that actually he's becoming more and more unhinged and actually he's the problem that they've got to solve. Um, but, yeah, I, I've, I think he adds a few dimensions to him. And again, there's that confrontation between Sorensen and the Doctor where the Doctor says the sort of rightly lauded line about uh, being a scientist and and all of that. That's, that's very good. But 
Yeah, I, I, yeah, he he does does quite well, um, especially considering he has a dreadful makeup and has to have CSO eyes as well, <laughs> yes. which is never a good look. With his eyelashes visible, so you know his eyes are closed. Yeah, I mean, I always remember the bit on the Tom Baker years video where where Tom is watching the transformation into Anti Man, and he's just there's a little circle of him in the corner of the screen, yes. and he's just he's giggling away, chuckling at this, and, and then goes ooh <laughs> almost. <laughs> so the question is, when does Sorensen first become Anti Man? Is it in Part Three when we see it, or does it happen earlier in the story, and we're only finding out about it as a surprise twist halfway through? I I think it might be earlier in the story, and I, and this is one of the things that Terence does is um, talk about what it is that Sorensen's drinking um, and uh, says that that's something that he'd been working on to try and counteract the effects. So obviously this is implying that Sorensen knows that he is turning into Anti-Man at, at some point sort of earlier in the script than we actually see on TV. So maybe some of the murders that do happen earlier on are re- sort of, he's responsible for. But if that's the case, the script needs to show us that. There needs to be this mystery killer in the shadows, and then we don't find out that it's Sorensen until part three, but then it's perfectly obvious all along what's been happening. Exactly, yeah. And this is why the script doesn't quite work. And a friend of mine um, always used to say, my friend Richard always used to say, that any script where the Doctor is still being accused of being the murderer in part four has fundamentally failed in some way because the Doctor should have won everyone over by that point and you should be trusting him. And Planet of Evil is the ultimate, still in part four, still being accused of the murders. Nothing has moved on. When the Doctor goes towards the end of part three, wrong again, Salomar you get the sense that the Doctor is as frustrated yes, as everybody else by the script's failure to evolve. Yes, he's exasperated by it. So we've talked a lot about what doesn't work about Planet of Evil, which means it's now time to pivot and talk about one of my favorite things. Let's talk about what Terence Dix gets right in the novelization of the same story two years later. Okay, well... I, um, funnily enough, um, our good friend Fraser Gregory is reading this book at the moment in anticipation of hearing this podcast. So I bought him a copy at Christmas, which was Ooh. a treat for him. And um, and he said that I had to mention at how good the first paragraph of the book is. It's another one of Terence Dix's absolutely killer openings i'll be reading that out later in the program fraser correctly read my mind i immediately seized on that as terrific yeah. terence prose yeah it it sets the stall for the whole story it's really really good and he again that sort of gets you ready for what should be a really good good adaptation but I'm not sure, like you said earlier on, that Terence's heart is really in this one. Um, compared to the two previous Terence Dix books that I've done on here, um, The Loch Ness Monster and Genesis of the Daleks, this is in no way up to their, their standard. He's not adding anything at all. He's not tweaking the dialogue. It's very much a verbatim, what you're seeing on the screen is coming... Um, into this book and you don't even get big descriptions of the of the few things that would make this distinctive so i was very disappointed that there wasn't a description of how alien and weird the jungle is that he could have gone to town on or the, the um scene where the doctor falls into the black pool and is sort of communicating in mysterious ways with the anti creature in there and that's weird and trippy on TV, and it's dismissed in a paragraph in the book, like he just wants to get it over with. There's that famous Terence line from The Eight Doctors years later where he describes the TV movie as a weird, fantastic adventure full of improbable and illogical events. Yes. And almost, that same line almost appears verbatim here 
in part it three. It does, doesn't it? Yes. The time in the antimatter pit. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it just doesn't live up to the memories that I had of reading this book as a as a child. So, as I said, this was one that I I really liked in book form when I was was young. I can remember my mum reading me this one sort of fairly vividly, but there just isn't very much to this adaptation at all i don't think so the last three terence books before this one and these are, these are all come out in a six month span so he's writing these one after the other dialect invasion of earth one of his best claws of axos one of his best brain of morbius tremendously entertaining we talked about yeah. those in episodes 30 31 and 33 respectively this book comes out two months after Brain of Morbius. The other books were all 135 pages or so. This one drops down to 120. And instead of commenting or riffing on every scene, he lets large portions of the story go by without putting on any sort of gloss or explanation. The only time he really perks up is when the Doctor starts quoting Romeo and Juliet. Terence then leans into it and starts adding some more lines to make sure that we know this is Shakespeare for the... Uh, for the younger reader. Yes. That part he really seems to enjoy. The rest of it, not so much. And he doesn't really get to do much with the characters either because these characters are so one-dimensional and flavorless that he doesn't really have a chance to beef them up and give them interesting descriptions. No, well, no, and that that's that's very telling. There is a very little description all round in this, in this book. Um, so it really just doesn't feel up to what he'd done and maybe this is sort of the beginning of the what people call the decline into um what the um audio um adaptations of the target books always call a workmanlike novel (laughs) well the talons of wang chiang book is coming out a few short months after this and that in many respects is one of terence's many magnum opuses so we know that he has great work left in him but he will soon be worn down, especially once the Graham Williams era arrives and he drops his books down to, you know, 9,500 page word count. And I'll say that again in English, a 9,500 page word count. So he's not quite defeated yet by the material, but he's definitely not as enthused here as he was for some of the earlier books. And you can sense that. Yeah. I think you really can sense that. So, because Although a lot of the Williams era books are are small and not haven't got the the word count, he still you always feel he's adding something or changing something or doing something interesting. Um, so something like Image of the Fendar, which is one of the the shortest books, has extra material and has extra bits where he's infused an extra um, and some really good passages of descriptive writing. But all of this. That just doesn't feel very much of that in this novel to grab hold of. If he likes the script, he will add to it and mythologize it. Horns of Nymon, which I covered on the Doctor Who Target Book Club Club podcast a while back, is a very good example. He gives it a prologue. He makes it epic. If the story is terrible, he will just go to town and mock it relentlessly like the Meglos novelization, which is coming up in quite a while. If the story is boring, he will almost fall asleep with the page and say, I cannot help this story because the writer gives me nothing to go on. And that's no. the case for Ark of Infinity, and it's certainly the case here. Yeah, exactly. He's just going to get it on the page, and that will have to do. There's not much that he can actually work with to make it any any better. Now, there are some entertaining parts to the book that I enjoyed reading page by page, and I will discuss those for the second half of the program but I think we're both kind of uh, a little bit tired of talking about Planet of Evil right now. So, Well, I've got one more thing that I want to say. I had, um, I, I've had, i got um, both editions of the book. We both have um, the Anti-Man heads oh, looming wow. on the cover. So the very lurid Mike Little cover and the slightly less lurid um, Andrew Skeletor cover. And because of these covers... I, and because you never see the body of Anti-Man, I thought that Anti-Man was actually a great big disembodied head that rolled around through the jungle as a kid. That was how I envisaged, envisaged it. It was really odd. 
to, to sort of see it on TV and realize that wasn't what they were going for at all. But especially on the first first um, cover where you've got a really big head and Tom Baker sort of backing away from it, almost looking um, sort of scared of of this face. That was exactly what I imagined as a small child that Anti-Man was. It was a great big disembodied head that rolled around the jungle. And also, because we read, me and my mum read um, Planet of Evil and Face of Evil in short succession because we had both of the books in our local library, I was convinced they were both based on the same planet because the jungles looked almost exactly the same on the oh, covers. Wow. So the cover art always sort of made a big impression on me so yeah so that that sort of jungle that we've got there that's um yeah looks very much like what um jeff cummins has painted on the on the face of evil cover with leela looming yes. out of the jungle and i believe the cover was inspired by um where the wild things are Oh, I can kind of see that. See, I don't have yeah. that cover. I have the 1984 Andrew Scaletta cover, which you hold, hold up. Yep, me too. And I even have an American edition of it with the with the Lyle Stewart sticker on the back. <laughs> oh, wow. I've got – I have the Lyle Stewart price stamp, but I do not have a Lyle Stewart sticker. Oh, I think I've got a sticker stuff over the top. But, yeah, the yeah, I've got that on, on the back of mine. So there we go. I'll be talking about Lyle Stewart in a little bit. He's a fascinating figure, and I'm always curious as to how he became Doctor Who's gatekeeper in the States, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Oh, that would be interesting. Which version of the book did you buy, Fraser? Um, I bought him the original cover, so I found it in a second handbook when I was visiting Joe Ford, so everything comes back to Joe. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, it is his universe, and we are all just living in uh, lower rent portions of it, that's for sure. It's true. I'll tell you my biggest Doctor Who misperception. I kept seeing, because I have the 1984 version, and it says, among many Doctor Who books available are the following recently published titles. Yep. So I would look at those titles, and I didn't know anything about the stories because I was a fairly new fan. So I kept misreading. I kept seeing Doctor Who and the Keeper of the Trocken. Doctor Who and the Keeper of the Trocken. Now, this is 1984. This is 1985. This is very shortly after Clash of the Titans came out. And you know the famous line, let loose the Trocken, which became Donald Trump's oh, yes. campaign's go-to line when they were trying to overturn the election results. We're, we're, we're going to let loose the, the, the crowd. No, no, they, they didn't. Uh, speaking of which, breaking news, uh, Boris Johnson has fired Michael Gove. Oh, oh, well, okay, so there's movement, but he's not going anywhere. I will refresh the page, because maybe something exciting has happened in the, in the last few minutes. And, of course, nothing is more exciting than audience uh, listening to me uh, look up news on my cell phone. <laughs> Boris Johnson does not intend to resign. Boris Johnson fires Michael. No, the Michael Gove firing is still the most recent story. Okay. So he's still hanging in there. So I think it is time now, Cy, for you and I to move to the games portion of the podcast. Okay. And I'm going to give you a choice. You can either guess that story in 20 questions or you can guess that cliffhanger. Right. Well, I think last time I did the cliffhanger, didn't I? So I think it's time for another 20 questions and see if I can guess the story. All right. I have picked out one random Doctor Who story from the randomizer.net. And it is one story between 1963 and 2022. I know which story it is. You do not. Using 20 yes or no questions, you will guess. Now, you are, I want to add, in case you missed it, you are currently the all-time record holder on this show right. for as few as questions to guess the story. Last time you played, you got it in seven. Right, okay. Let's see if I can at least equal that, <laughs> if nothing else. Last week, Adam Clay came very close to being you, just fell short. But if anybody can break your own record... It is almost certainly you. Right. Okay. So, I mean, I've heard various people's different strategies at how to play this now. So, I mean, I was coming in in the early days, so it was, it was difficult to guess. There's no wrong way to play. Nobody has failed yet. Exactly. So, um, okay, I'm going to say 
is it a 21st century story? No, it is not. Question number okay. two. Okay. Is it a black and white story? No, it is not. Question number three. Oh, is it a Tom Baker story? Yes, yes, it is. And now we're cooking with gas. Question number four. Okay. Is it a Graham Williams story? No, it is not Graham Williams. Question five. Oh, now oh, I haven't got much left. Does it feature Sarah Jane Smith? It does not feature Sarah Jane Smith. Question six. I think we're up to now. Question six. Okay. Um, is it a Leela story? It is not a Leela story. Question seven. This is your chance to tie if you want to take a wild guess. Okay, I'm going to have to take a wild guess at this point. Is it full circle? It is not full oh. circle. We already mentioned full circle earlier in the program. It is not full circle. So right. now okay. your record remains safe. You are not going to be the one to break yes, the record. I've, yeah, I haven't toppled myself, so that's fine. Um, <laughs> okay. So does it feature the master? Yes, yes, it does. Question nine. Is it Legopolis? It is not Legopolis. Oh, so it's 10. the Keeper of Trocken. It is not the Keeper of the Trocken. No, Question it's 11. Deadly Assassin, isn't it? Yes, it is Deadly Assassin. <laughs> there we go. I'd forgotten about the Deadly Assassin for a moment there. There we go. If you were going to go companion by companion, you never would have gotten it because it is the one companionless story. Exactly. So and there I we go. You were going down the road when you asked if it was a Leela story. Fortunately, you did not keep barking up that tree. No, well, that, yeah, you see, I'd forgotten about the Deadly Assassin, and I thought, oh, well, if it's a, if I say it's a Leela story, then I've got a one in three chance of getting it at this point. So. <laughs> oh, right. Well, because it is Leela, it is Leela, but not Graham Williams. Exactly. So, but there we go. I am now going to reload the randomizer for my next victim. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's a good one. Whoever comes on and does the 20 questions game next is going to have a really, really interesting choice. Oh, well, good luck. Yes. So before you go, Cy, what I've been having my guests do lately is give me a recommendation. Give the audience a recommendation for something you are enjoying now, whether it is Doctor Who related or not Doctor Who related, podcast or not a podcast. Okay. Well, do you know, this very evening I, I was, I've been working my way through the Season 22 collection um, Blu-ray and this evening, I have thoroughly enjoyed and roared with laughter all the way through Time Lash, which unexpectedly I have I, I really enjoyed. And season 22 is not one of my favourite eras of Doctor Who. Um, and I like a story where there's a bit of a bit of humour and a bit of light. And I have to say, Time Lash has gone right up in my estimation after watching these stories in order. And it's just what you need after a lot of relentless horror. So that and Mark of the Rani have really stood out on this rewatch for me. So I'm going to recommend Time Lash. And you might not ever hear that those words ever again. This may indeed be your final ever appearance on Doctor Who Literature. <laughs> with a recommendation like that. Huh. I'm a man of <laughs> I'm a man of contrary opinions as well, you know. Let me ask, what sold you? Is there new special effects, or is it because of the behind-the-sofa commentary? Or uh... the new special effects were 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 pretty decent. So, although I did laugh at what they've done with the interior of the time lash, which didn't sit so well with me, uh, it's probably better than the balsa woods, but not by much. <laughs> um, but. For me, it's just Paul Darrow's performance, I think, that lifts this into something that you wouldn't see anywhere else. No one else is giving it what he is giving it. He's bringing something to this, this story that it doesn't really deserve. And that makes it memorable and something special and to be cherished, I think. I have written in praise of his performance because the episode is so badly written the logic is not there. Most of the acting is abysmal. The only two performances that work are Robert Ashby's voice. Yes, which is really good. The 15 seconds of Dennis Carey is good, but it's only 15 seconds. 
And then, yeah, like you say, you have to do something in a script this bad to make it lively. And oh, yeah. Does some, now, whether or not he goes over the top is certainly a matter on which reasonable fans can disagree. He is doing his best to be memorable. And I think an ambitious failure is always better than a safe, boring, dull snooze fest. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, the script is appalling. The Most of the acting is appalling. It's yeah, it suffers from pennant Robert Itis that there's no momentum. The sets are dreary, but Paul Darrow is never dreary. And he's not on the same page as anybody else, but I like the page that he's on. Yes, I'd be quite happy up there. He seemed to make a career out of it, so he did very well. On the original audio commentary for the DVD, which would have come out in 2007 or so, he says, somewhere on the audio commentary, he says, don't watch after I'm dead. It's boring, which is certainly (laughs) true. Yes, and there's the great exchange between him and Colin Baker where um, Colin Baker says, Paul, do you think that style of acting will ever come back into fashion? And Paul Darrow just turns around and laughing his head off and says, for me, it never went out of fashion. (laughs) (laughs) So he's at least (laughs) self-aware. See, I do not have the season 22 box. So, you know, I still have season 17 and it's original plastic shrink wrap waiting for a chance. As soon as season 22 comes out in the States, I will get a copy, but it is not available here yet. No, you're probably a couple of months off, aren't you? So it took a while for it to arrive in the UK, really. So, What is your guess for the next box set release after this one? Well... I'm, I'd be quite happy if everyone's sort of rumour is true and it's season two and have a black and white one. That would be amazing. But also I think there's a possibility of another Davison coming up shortly. So Mark Strickson is in the UK at the moment. So I suspect he's probably busy filming bits for 20 and 21. So either of those would be a joy to have. So I like those very much. Now, how would you do the cover art for season 21? Because at least stateside, the cover art is always the doctor right up close and then a montage below him of things in that season. Season 21 is that rare animal, which we haven't seen since season four. It is a two-doctor season. Yeah, that's going to be tricky. I don't know what they're going to do there, but it'd be interesting to find out. I'm sure Lee Binding has an idea even now. Of course. And if Lee is listening to this program, Lee, let us know. We are definitely curious. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, Of course, the possibility always exists that they could just air season 21, the Davison years, and do a separate twin dilemma only Blu-ray at a later date. (laughs) That'd be a top seller. (laughs) Uh, By top seller, you mean a bottom seller. Yes. Yes. I'm not going to be spending a lot of money for a twin dilemma only Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the audience is not there for that. <laughs> no, the season, again, I am a huge fan of all the seasons we've mentioned. I think the Hartnell era is just start to finish incredible. I am trying to get somebody to have me on their show so I can talk about season three. The production season three, going from Myth Makers up to the Smugglers. That is a fascinating story. That is Doctor Who in one year, falling apart, seven companions in a year. I would love to have that conversation, but of course nobody's had me on to have it. But season three would be difficult on Blu-ray because most of it just doesn't exist. Season two, all you have to do is reconstruct half of the crusade and you're there. Yeah, exactly. And of all the 60 seasons, it's the closest to being being finished. So yeah, it seems like a, a shoe in really. So, But we'll see. They They always surprise us and come up with something that we don't expect. So let's, yeah. Let's hope they do that again. Season 20 is where I come in. Season 21, with the exception of Twin Dilemma, I think is one of the best seasons ever. So I am very excited for all of it. Yeah, well, me too. It's all Doctor Who, and it's all great. Even the bits that aren't great, like Planet of Evil, are are all right, really. (laughs) Well, Sai, it's been great having you back. And uh, in spite of your uh, controversial recommendation of Time Lash... We will have you back on for a fifth appearance real soon. Fantastic. I look forward to it. I'm loving rediscovering the books, even 
a lesser Terence Dix book, there's always something in it that is worthwhile. And at least this one, we've got the opening paragraph. There is some really good material here that I'll talk about after the break, which you can uh, listen to after the program goes out. I actually have a longer script for this episode, at least my half of it, than I did for Brain of Morbius. So I will have a lot to say. Whether or not that a lot to say is actually meritorious and interesting (laughs) is up to my listeners, but I have a lot to say. Well, I look forward to hearing it. And the rest of us will see you after the break. Doctor Who and the Planet of Evil, written by Terence Dix, televised as Planet of Evil, teleplay by Louis Marx, televised in September and October 1975, published in August 1977. A survey team of eight men from the mighty Merestrian Empire lands on Zeta Minor, a remote planet on the fringes of the universe. Before their expedition is over, seven of the men are mysteriously and horrifically murdered. A distress signal brings the doctor to the planet, but his good intentions are not appreciated. The commander of our Amoresterian rescue party, sent to investigate the disappearance of the survey team, is convinced the doctor is the killer. And while the doctor is kept prisoner and powerless to act, the merciless hell planet claims even more victims. What can we learn about this book before opening it? Well, I don't recall exactly when I bought it but I suspect it was one of the very last novelizations I purchased at one of three different Who conventions that I attended in the 1990s, two in Chicago and one in Toronto. For one thing, my copy looks unread. For another, I never marked off the cliffhangers. Planet of Evil was in 1985, watching the Tom Baker era on PBS for the first time, one of the very few stories I just didn't enjoy, as I mentioned to Cy earlier. Now, I was raised to worship at the altar of Forbidden Planet. I distinctly recall my father once made us stay at a service station for an extra hour because Forbidden Planet was playing on the waiting room TV on a local TV station, and even though our car was ready for pickup, we stayed to watch the entire end of the movie. So, I pretty instantly recognized the earliest appearances of the Antimatter Beast as a blatant Uh, tribute, shall we say, to Forbidden Planet. But other than that, the story never landed with me. So my copy is a fourth edition reprint from 1984, and I suspect that the verbose back cover blurb, which I just read out, which does have the amazing phrase, Merciless Hell Planet, is not the original text. Now my version also has the neon tube logo on the cover in red, outlined in white, and of course that logo didn't exist in 1977. The original cover was the second straight Mike Little illustration, Frederick Yeager's slavering anti-man jaws, with a nifty inset of Tom Baker cowering in terror, the reprint sadly losing Tom Baker entirely. My copy also bears a Lyle Stewart Inc. price sticker on the back, advertising the price at $2.95 US. Lyle Stewart was a really interesting cat, We'll have to talk about him at length a little bit later on when I finish talking about the Pinnacle books. Uh, He was the business manager for EC Comics, the controversial horror and crime comics publisher, which was subjected to a vicious U.S. Senate hearing in the 1950s. He later sued his detractors and founded this publishing company, which was described in his New York Times obituary as, quote, a publisher of renegade titles. Now, I wouldn't describe Terrence Dix's slim 120-page volume here, a page countdown significantly from his last three books, including last week's Doctor Who and the Brain of Morbius, as we discussed on episode 33. I wouldn't describe this book as a renegade. Interestingly, Stewart sold his company in 1988, and that catalog was eventually acquired by Kensington Books, a parent company of Pinnacle Books, which, of course, had that famous limited 10-book Doctor Who license in the States. Publishing is a very small world, which, I guess, makes sense, because this is a very small book. Now, as Cy told you earlier via Fraser, the opening passages of this book are formidable, probably among Terence's best intros. And I'll try to do justice the way that Fraser would read it. The planet 
was alive. Not just with the life that swarmed in the teeming jungles. There was another kind of life, something ancient, alien, hostile to man. It was as if the entire planet was one colossal living being that watched, waited, chose its moment, and struck. Eight men had come to explore this remote planet on the fringes of the known universe. A survey team from the mighty Merestran Empire, equipped with all the technology of a super-civilization. Eight men had landed. Now there were three. The planet was alive, and it was a killer. Terence also beefs up Brown's death. On TV, Brown, a minor character who dies at about the four-minute mark, vanishes in a simple roll-back-and-mix effect, with the plant props changing position slightly as he disappears. In the book, Chapter 1, Terence reimagines the moment, quote, As the invisible alien entity sucked him in, Brown, too, became invisible. Slowly he vanished, struggling wildly, cursing and screaming, firing useless bolts from his rifle. Feet, legs, body disappeared. The invisible tide crept higher, swallowing head and shoulders. With a last, terrible scream, Brown vanished completely. Terence's usual boilerplate introductions of the Doctor and Sarah and the TARDIS, taking up pages 13 through 15 in the text, briefly recap the events of the previous televised story, Terror of the Zygons, novelized quite a bit earlier as Doctor Who and the Loch Ness Monster, episode 18, and there's a footnote in the text again. As with the previous book, Brain of Morbius, Terence here doesn't really wrestle with the TV material. He doesn't reorder scenes. He doesn't consolidate long sequences although he will condense expository scenes into briefer sections, like the Doctor and Sarah's first scene on the Zeta Minor surface, which drops from nine lines of dialogue on TV to just two in the book. And the dialogue is mostly faithful to the TV, with the odd changed word here or there, hardly worth remarking on. But on page 16, Terence does give Sarah Jane a point. Liz Sladen gets off a neat line on TV about the Doctor always acting rude when he's trying to cover up a mistake, which the Doctor ignores, but in the book, Terence adds for Tom Baker, How well you know me, the Doctor smiled, ruefully. One of Terence's less successful bits of characterization occurs on page 19. As Sarah realizes that the distress signal they've been chasing comes from humanoids, not aliens. It was all very well, Terence has Sarah think, for the Doctor to say one life form was just the same as another. He was used to that sort of thing. Huh? Doubling down, Terence then adds, Sarah felt happier with more human types. It was easier to tell the goodies from the baddies. Whoops, um, either that is clever foreshadowing about the fact that Salomar is not a goodie, or maybe somebody just needs to watch Galaxy 4. Chapter 2 is where Terence introduces the Merestran spaceship crew, Salomar, Vashinsky, Ponty, and Dahan, all at once. Ponty is a... Minimal presence on TV. Terence in the book does make clear that he's A, the executive officer, and B, subordinate to Vyshinsky, whose role in the Merestran Starfleet is never quite made clear. But Vyshinsky is an experienced veteran, and Salomar is a young, politically connected officer in over his head. Terence focuses on the conflict between these two by annotating every line of their dialogue together to make clear which one knows what they're doing and which one doesn't. For the other characters, Dahan is characterized only by his having fair hair, and Ponty is somewhat unfortunately characterized as being, quote, tall and dark. This is, to be fair, more characterization than Louis Marx gave either Dahan or Ponty on TV, so Terence is trying to make it work. If he doesn't succeed, you can blame the script and not the adapter. Terence gives us an odd simile on page 29 as the Merestrian crew encases the TARDIS and spray on plastic for transposition back to the spaceship. Wrapped up in plastic like a supermarket chicken, Terence says. Um, okay, I've been at this for about seven months now, and I can safely say that is not his best bit of prose. He also gives a slight visual change from how the transposition effect was seen to work on TV, that adds a Star Trek-style transporter sequence to bring Vashinsky's away team down to the Zeta Minor surface that is implied on TV but never visualized. The general sense is that Terence is a bit at sea when writing this book, not impressed with the script and struggling to impose order on the story. He decides that Morelli, for example, Michael Wisher's last 
Doctor Who role, excluding Shakedown, is the Merestrian's expedition science officer, the fact I think is never even suggested on screen. Terence does try to do more with Salomar's unhinged behavior on TV, explaining on page 35 that Salomar, quote, felt overwhelmed by the baffling turn of events, the constant demands for new and more difficult decisions. And again on page 40, quote, all three of his subordinates looked inquiringly at Salomar, and he felt a sudden urge of panic. Fighting it down, he took refuge, as usual, in arbitrary decision. Put him with the other prisoner. We must try and contact the home planet again. Not a chance, controller. This far out, we're on our own. Well? We've searched the wide belt of the jungle in all directions. No sign of any other life. So that seems to, to narrow the killer down to our two aliens. Prepare to execute them. Let's go, shall we? How? Oh. Through the window. They're magnetically locked. But the power is low. Not exactly magical, sparkling, magnetic dialogue, is it? Though Liz Sladen, as always, saves even a sparsely written, functional, escape from captivity scene. Something interesting about Planet of Evil, though Marx's largely unpoetic script doesn't really lean into it or explore it, is the diversity of the names of the Merestrian crew. There are vague hints that Merestra is a long-distant Earth colony, in material in the novelization, but not on TV, from the Part 1 material, the Merestrians recognize the function of a police box from their historical records. The crew names are international. O'Hara, Dahan, Morelli, Ranjit, as it is said on TV, but that's mispronounced, Ponty. Louis Mahoney is a rare black actor, and this time in Doctor Who's existence. And the last such actor, three years earlier, was also Louis Mahoney in Frontier in Space. He did wonderful emotional work in Blink three full decades later, Except this script gives him nothing to do. For my people, we have Vyshinsky, and in Simon Messingham's far more visceral and atmospheric late 1990s past Doctor Adventure novel Zeta Major, a lot more is explored of Merestrian religion. The one effort the script makes, on screen, is to have one murdered crewman administered quote-unquote Merestrian Orthodox rites. In Zeta Major, the events of this story, by the way, have become literal scripture, and some characters sit down to watch part one on videotape, complete with the Tom Baker Vortex opening credits. Vyshinsky is cast in the role of traitor, Judas, to Salomar's uh, somebody else. That's a bit uh, on the nose, actually, but... The book does not really play into any of this texture. Terence doesn't take the opportunity that Messingham would later take to play in this implied sandbox of a diverse, culturally rich Merestrian civilization. In a straight, spare adaptation that doesn't rearrange scenes for narrative flow, and while you can't really do much to improve on the flat TV dialogue, Terence leans in where he can, in terms of the vyshinsky salomar power struggle, such as by dropping into Vyshinsky's head when the scripts give him nothing else to do, like so. Vyshinsky looked after him, a cynical smile on his lips. His brilliant young controller was learning that there was more to commanding than wearing a fancy uniform, he wondered how long Salomar would hold up under the strain. To a Dr. Sarah scene from early in Part 2, Terence does play around with the text a little bit, as he did in the last book, Brain of Morbius, as well as some others before that. He goes all pertwee on the Tom Baker Doctor, inserting a My Dear Sarah, where none existed on TV. And to Tom Baker's habit of adding Shakespeareisms to the text, Terence has Sarah point out to the younger reader, What? Oh, I get it. Shakespeare. Then he also writes, quote, The doctor replied with another quotation. This is as Baker shifts from Romeo and Juliet to Hamlet. Let's give a listen. I was lucky. Fortunately, time is on our side. Time? Yes. Night's candles are burned out. Okay. And Jock and Day stands tiptoe on the misty mountaintop. Or something like that. Oh, you mean it's getting light? That's what Shakespeare meant. Doesn't it like daylight? 
That is the question. Terence also adds a little bit of material to improve the next Dr. Sarah scene after that. As Sarah mentions, quote, elfin spirits of the forest. And Terence writes, she was rather pleased with this apt Shakespearean quotation, but the doctor seemed to take it literally. And when the doctor references having met the man, as we'll learn more of in City of Death, Terence has Sarah reflect, by now Sarah was used to the casual familiarity with which the doctor spoke of the most eminent historical figures. Still on chapter 4, Terence has Morelli, quote, break into Sorensen's lecture. And Terence amends a Salomar line to correct the antimatter creature's body count, where on TV in part 2 he neglected to include O'Hara's death in the total. There's a confusing bit on TV where Ponty is standing with his back to the antimatter pool, trying to search the Doctor and Sarah, when he suddenly screams and falls backward into the pool, presumably to his death, although it's later established that not everyone who falls into the pool dies, so maybe he's still out there somewhere, in search of his character's run of three big finished box sets, Ponty's journeys through the infinite unknown. I think the intent behind the death scene as staged, if it was a death scene, was supposed to be the antimatter creature, the forbidden planet thingy, dragging him backwards. Terence evidently felt that the script slash TV action needed clarification, because he restages the moment, as Ponty accidentally being tripped by one of his own men, and falling due to this more obvious mechanical cause. Terence then precludes the big finish box set theory by showing us Ponty's desiccated corpse by the antimatter pool, in the moments before the part two cliffhanger, at the end of chapter 6, don't look for Ponty's body, you won't see it on TV. Terence gives some flavor to the first page of chapter 7, that's the first page of the part 3 material, with his trademark sardonic wit at the story's expense. Remembering that part 2 cliffhanger is a patented David Maloney freeze frame of Tom Baker falling into the antimatter pool, and that Sarah Jane was, in a very meta way, watching this unfold on television on the Morestrant ship, Sarah screams. And Terence writes, realizing she was talking to a monitor screen, she turned to Vashinsky. Terence also gets in his, like, 9,000th dig at Professor Sorensen's scientific detachment over the doctor's seeming death, adding a sharp line that wasn't given to Frederick Yeager on TV. At least he'll have a chance to find out if his theories are true. And Terence juxtaposes this against Sorensen's possessive obsession with his precious Zeta Minor Minerals, you know, the minerals that, at the halfway point of the story, pivot Planet of Evil from a Forbidden Planet remake to a sci-fi retelling of the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Apropos of nothing, I once had an optometry exam for a new pair of glasses with the Dr. Hyde and told him, gee, I'm really glad that Dr. Jekyll isn't here. And he very wryly responded, never heard that one before. Anyway, the TV story doesn't tell us when Sorensen came under the influence of the antimatter dust, whether it happened while he was leading the exposition on Zeta Minor, or for the very first time when we see it happen in Part 3. Dipping back to the Forbidden Planet theme, if Sorensen is really Morbius, and that's Walter Pidgeon from the movie, not Michael Spice's turn in last week's episode, it makes sense that he fell under the influence long ago, and the red antimatter beast was really his id all along. Terence, who makes no allusions to either Forbidden Planet or The Tempest in this book, merely adds, as if to chide the writer who hadn't made it clear for him, it was as if this was not the first time such a horrible transformation had come over him. Much later, in the last pages of the Part 3 material, Terence adds an explanatory paragraph to confirm that Sorensen's regressions did indeed begin on Zeta Minor, though we don't learn if he killed any of his fellow crew members there the way that he killed Morelli and Dahan, and some of the others on board the spaceship, the way that Morbius in Forbidden Planet had inadvertently killed all of his Bellerophon shipmates. Some changes in Chapter 7. Tom Baker does not mutter about Vandervelt's equations upon recovering from unconsciousness in the book. The fourth Doctor on TV was always waking up in mid-sentence. Then in the book, Vashinsky tells Sarah why he went out of his way to save the Doctor's life, which he didn't on TV. Terence restores a presumably forgotten line to the Doctor, explaining Sarah's puzzling on-screen question, Your promise as a Time Lord? Terence also explains that having a bit of antimatter in the Doctor's pocket, in a toffee tin, helped him survive his fall into the pool. It was a sort of passport, the Fourth Doctor says in the book. And to explain what the Doctor is doing in the pool in the first place, Terence on page 80 mentions the wonder and terror of his journey into another dimension, 
of the strangeness of his encounter with a creature so completely and utterly alien. A line which, by the way, reminds me of the famous, it had been a weird, fantastic adventure full of improbable, illogical events, which Terence used in The Eight Doctors to describe, or if you will, criticize the 1996 TV movie. In Chapter 8, Terence adds no gloss at all to Morelli's funeral. Remember, the one bit of genuine color that marks a script as produced gave to all those international Earth surnames among the Morestran crew. No invented explanation for what Morestran orthodox means, or what was the significance of the music played at his funeral in space. That's odd for Terence at this point in the target line, although it will become common over the next couple of dozen books for him to add less detail. I do, however, love the follow-up line that the doctor was, quote, sublimely unaware that he had just been attending a funeral. And Terence continues to humanize Vyshinsky at the expense of Salomar, such as on page 89, with Terence writing, Sarah realized there was real grief behind his flippant manner. As far as I can tell from my memories, counting forward from the day when I know for a fact I would have first seen Robot Part 1 on my local PBS station, I can figure that Planet of Evil Part 4 must have aired on Wednesday, March 13, 1985. I didn't see the episode live, and I didn't get a chance to record it on what was then my one single solitary on loan from my father VHS tape. I have no recollection why I didn't watch or tape Planet of Evil Part 4. It wasn't the night that I went to my one New York Mets baseball game of 1985. That happened about a month later. And besides, March would still have been spring training down in Florida. There were no major American holidays happening that week, although the internet informs me that the next day, Thursday the 14th, would have been National Popcorn Lover's Day and National Potato Chip Day. Be still my beating heart if only I had known about those holidays at the time. Guilty pleasures, popcorn and potato chips, or crisps for most of my audience. There were no Jewish holidays that night that would have kept us out of the house at Temple. I just don't recall why I didn't watch Planet of Evil Part 4 anymore. I do know that because the Tom Baker stories didn't cycle around on my PBS stations again until probably 1987 or 88, and because I didn't acquire this novelization until the 90s, it would have been a long time before I learned how the story ended. Think back to episode 30 of this podcast and John Peel's story about missing episode 5 of the Dalek invasion of Earth in late 1964 because he had to go to a party and not seeing the episode in question for another 20 years or so. I didn't have to wait quite that long, but wait, I did. Planet of Evil Part 3 is a good cliffhanger, make no mistake. Right out of the Batman 1966 tradition, Batman and Robin about to be killed by some fiendishly clever sadistic plan. My friend John, one of my two school friends who got me into Doctor Who, was able to watch Part 4. He spent the next day at school drawing pictures of Sorensen as Anti-Man. I was jealous, A, of his drawing abilities, and B, he'd seen the episode when I hadn't. On page 101, Terence tries to make sense of the moment where Salomar acquiesces to Vyshinsky seizing command in the resolution to the Part 3 cliffhanger by adding, Salomar stared furiously at the older man. He would have liked to seize control again, to have Vyshinsky arrested, but his nerve failed him. Though earlier, at the end of Chapter 9, the actual Part 3 cliffhanger moment, Terence writes slightly differently to what we saw on TV, where Salomar cruelly forced Vyshinsky to push the ejection lever. There's no physical scuffle between the two men in the book. On page 105, Terence adds that the Doctor has familiarity with cases of antimatter poisoning from the Time Lord files, as a way of explaining how the Doctor acquired all his convenient plot-solving knowledge on TV. And no, I'm not going to discuss how Terence describes senior crew leader Ranjit's accent. I'm really not. Let's listen to this instead. Keep away! I, I require an explanation. Professor Sorensen, you're ill. What do you mean, ill? You think you've discovered an oral vaccine to protect you against antiquark penetration, but you're wrong. It worked? For a time, but it's set up a cycle of chemical change. There's no way back, Solomonson. You've reached the point where your tissues are so monstrously hybridized that the next metabolic change could be the final one. No. There isn't much time. No. You and I are scientists, Professor. 
We buy our privilege to experiment at the cost of total responsibility. That's actually a really good scene there. Baker and Jaeger underplaying it perfectly. We're a long way off on this show from reaching the Graham Williams era, the era where Tom Baker spent, by my calculations, 40% of his time fondling the TARDIS console in increasingly comical ways. It's just a spare, effective scene. Terence fills it out in the book, repeatedly placing the adverb sadly before the Doctor's exhortations for Sorensen to kill himself. He adds more dialogue to round out the meaning of the words. That's fine for the book, although I'm glad we have the TV version of this scene, too. Unusually for Terence, the book wraps up in 11 chapters, rather than his by now standard 12. Chapter 11 is a bit longer than usual. Page 117 contains a suggestive line about how the Doctor, quote, dragged out a set of heavy chains, a relic of some long-ago adventure. I really should have talked about that while I still had Psy on the line. So much ground for fertile debate there, my friends. The rest of Chapter 11 is slightly restructured. The TV action had intercut between Sarah and Vyshinsky on the bridge, struggling off an advancing army of anti-men, and the Doctor and Sorensen grappling in both the TARDIS console room and by the Black Pool on Zeta Minor. Terence separates these out into separate scenes, and also teases, if not mocks, the plot logic of each half. He notes twice how rare it is that the Doctor can land the TARDIS exactly where it needs to be, not exactly a skill the TARDIS had ever shown up until this point in series history, the first produced story of season 13. And he also notes, twice, how much time Vyshinsky spends fighting off the anti-men on the ship when they're about to crash into the planet anyway. It was either heroic or crazy, thought Sarah, or maybe it was both, Terence writes. And in the denouement, again packed into chapter 11, rather than moved into a traditional chapter 12, Terence again pokes fun at the TARDIS's amazing newfound navigational ability. Quote, Mentally, the doctor crossed his fingers. This was his second tricky navigational job in swift succession. He now had to put the TARDIS back inside a spaceship, which was no doubt zooming away from Zeta Minor just as fast as it could travel. The dry sarcasm is palpable. On page 125, Terence adds to the Doctor's seemingly flippant suggestion about Sorensen deriving power from the, quote, kinetic force of actual planetary movement by handing the Professor equations and by thinking about breaking the Time Lord code by sharing such data. But, again, read Zeta Major. Really good PDA. Please read Zeta Major. For a take on just how badly that idea is going to work out in practice. And also for the Zeta Major scene where the characters watch Planet of Evil on TV. That's been more than 25 years since I read that, and it still cracks me up. Terence, however, does not go for the greedy nihilism of the Messingham novel yet to come. He adds a valedictory final paragraph that turns out quite differently to Zeta Major. Quote, so the adventure ended, and they all went their different ways. Sorensen went home to begin the series of brilliant experiments that was to make him the most famous scientist in the Marestran Empire. Vyshinsky returned to a hero's welcome, and the promotion that had so long eluded him. And the Doctor and Sarah went off to begin their next adventure. I don't know about you, but I've now read every Terence novel in rapid succession over the seven months of this podcast, and that just feels pretty sarcastic to me. How about you? Let us know what you think. Next time on Doctor Who Literature, third Doctor books are about to become exceedingly rare, Join us in September 1977 for the second and final Pertwee era novelization of the year. If you don't join us, we'll all be done for. It's Doctor Who and the Mutants. Thank you for joining me on another episode of the Doctor Who Literature Podcast. I'm Jason, your host and editor and producer. Special thanks to my special guest, Cy Hart. This podcast can be found on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. Google Podcasts, Spotify, and most of your podcast apps of choice. You can find all past episodes at anchor.fm slash Doctor Who Lit, 
It really helps if you rate five stars and subscribe. You can find me on Twitter at Doctor Who Novels, that's DR Who Novels, and you can also find me on the Trap One podcast. I write about Doctor Who on Twitter using the hashtag Doctor Who Pilgrimage, that's DR Who Pilgrimage. Please drop me a line with your comments, questions, and suggestions. Next time, we'll be discussing another novelization, and we'll again be joined by a very special guest. Thank you for listening, and whatever you do, keep turning the pages.